Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Ashok Srivastava. Ashok is the chief data officer of Intuit, a finance and accounting software company that earns nearly $13 billion in annual revenue. Ashok has been in his role for nearly five years, which is among the longest tenures for a role known for short tenures on average. I look forward to hearing more about how he's driven success in a role where others have not. As chief data officer, he focuses on analytics, data systems, large-scale machine learning, and AI development and deployment. We'll cover each in this interview as well. Ashok is also on the board of directors of the University of Colorado Foundation. He has a PhD in electrical engineering from that university. He's also been an adjunct professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at Stanford University for more than eight years now. Ashok, welcome to Technovation. It's great to speak with you today. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Peter, it's so great to be here and thank you for inviting me. It's uh, very exciting to be able to share our journey and to be able to converse with you. Oh, I, I feel the same way. Thank you for saying so. Ashok, I, I thought we would begin with your company. Uh, you work for Intuit and have done so for a bit more than uh, than a half a decade in your in your role. I, I think many of the people who are watching or listening now would be familiar with Intuit, but it probably still is not a bad idea for you to add a bit of context. Uh, talk a bit about Intuit's business, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Peter. So Intuit is a company that's been around for about 40 years, and we make uh, software so that people can understand and do better in their financial lives. So we have QuickBooks, which is for small businesses, and small businesses use QuickBooks to manage their books, to understand cash flow, to do payroll, and many other things. We have TurboTax, we have Mint, and TurboTax, uh, uh, consumers from around the country and in Canada can actually get their taxes done through a variety of experiences. Some of those experiences can be do it yourself, it can be done for you, and it can be done actually in an assisted capacity where somebody works with you to do your taxes. We have a similar offering in QuickBooks. We have Mint, which helps people understand their personal financial situation. Credit Karma, which also works there to help people not only understand their financial situation, but make great decisions based on that for their credit. And then also MailChimp, which helps small businesses and others really scale out their business and contact their customers in order to provide the right message at the right time. So it's a company which is formulated, which was created specifically to help people do better in their financial lives. Our mission is to power prosperity around the world through the use of technology, through the use in my world of AI analytics and data. Well, Ashok, um, let's begin with your role. I mentioned it a moment ago as chief data officer of Intuit, and I provided uh, just a very brief uh, thumbnail sketch of some of what that entails. Maybe peel that back a little bit further, if you would, and talk a bit about your own purview in that role at Intuit. Yeah. So my role as chief data officer started uh, a bit more than five years ago now, and I've been working in this role to build out a couple of things. First, our AI strategy. In fact, I joined as the chief data officer, but my focus was on artificial intelligence, showing how artificial intelligence could actually be used to transform customer experiences. And as time went on, then new areas uh, became added to my portfolio. So that included data, and it also included analytics. And so now it's artificial intelligence, data, and analytics, all three of these areas coming together. And I can tell you, Peter, that it's an incredibly rewarding and very, very exciting journey to be on because what we're seeing here is literally the transformation of a very storied 40-year-old company into a very, very powerful modern tech operation. And that transformation is something that I feel very privileged to be part of. Fascinating and and a really good context as well. An organization, as you point out, that is storied has had a number of remarkable executives, remarkable products, uh, has experienced tre tremendous growth as well. I, I wonder, uh, take a bit more time, if you would, uh, to describe how the areas that you lead are helping in that transformation uh, towards becoming more data centric, uh, focused on analytics, uh, you know, creative use of artificial intelligence. Um, we'd love to understand a little bit more of how that fits into the broader transformation of a of an organization uh, with a tenure and, and, and longevity like like yours. 
The way I think about this is that Intuit is an incredibly customer-focused company. Um, as I talk to people, as I reflect on the journey that the company has gone through, there's one thing that is always paramount, and that is driving customer benefit. And the reason I start there is because literally all of the technology that we build, all of the stories that we build, all of the products, all of the experiences start from that point. So we start with this deep customer empathy and we step back and we say, how can we solve for, let's say, a, a person who is living in South Bend, Indiana, who's trying to make ends meet? That person might be uh, working two jobs. They might be self-employed. They might also have a job at a grocery store, and they're trying to understand how to bring their finances together in order to pay for their kid's education and to pay for the insurance that they have to cover. Now, in that process, what we start thinking about is how can we simplify the tax experience for this person, or how can we simplify the way they're managing their books so that that person can spend the most time that they have on focusing on what matters most to them, which might be running that small business and paying for the, the things that they need to do. That's where we start. So when we go from that point and we think about things like, for instance, that person might have a lot of transactions coming in through their small business, and we don't want them to spend all of their time categorizing their transactions. We really want them to focus on running the small business and maybe paying for the things that they need to pay for. And as we go through that process, we've created artificial intelligence systems that can actually summarize and literally categorize those transactions for the person automatically. So instead of waiting through hundreds or potentially thousands of transactions, it's all done for them automatically. And this is something that is really transformational. You know, I used to own small businesses. I've run many small businesses. And I can remember sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to sit down and, and categorize all these financial transactions one by one by one by one? Instead of doing that, QuickBooks does this automatically. Instead of a person sitting down and saying, now I have to wade through literally 80,000 pages of the US tax code. Instead, what happens is that TurboTax allows that person to just answer the smallest number of questions necessary to maintain compliance with the tax code, but get their taxes done quickly. And these are things that I'm really excited about. They're great applications of artificial intelligence and also of data because data powers all of these experiences. Yeah. And you mentioned at the outset, uh, Ashok, that your areas of focus are artificial intelligence, data, and analytics. And obviously, the Venn diagram between, between those categories, there's significant overlap. Uh, you know, Each are related to the others as well. How do you think about those in terms of distinct areas of focus? They are distinct areas of focus, but the remarkable thing is it is, as you said, a Venn diagram. And at the intersection of this is where magic happens. So I always start with data because data, in my opinion, is the substrate of any modern company. All companies and I, I, anyone that I can think of has data at its foundation. And so we are building some very powerful data systems that can transport, that can manage, that can manipulate data at scale and provide that data to scale to people all across the company with the right permissions so that they can analyze the data, so that they can use the data to power uh, these customer experiences that we have. That data foundation is the uh, most important layer. On top of that, we have artificial intelligence, and we have analytics. And these two fields are similar, but there are some important differences. When I talk about artificial intelligence, I'm talking about systems that learn through experience, and those systems adapt to the changing environment that they're operating in to deliver customer experiences. So what I mean by that is that they learn through data, and they help people like you and me and customers make better financial decisions. That's what I mean by artificial intelligence. Analytics is a little bit different. What, what's happening there is that our analysts are actually 
writing queries to understand the data, to make sense of the data, and to help our business partners, to help our uh, product managers, program managers make the best decisions so that we can run the business and actually deliver the best value for the end customer. So this is an important part of our overall way we think about customers. I'm going to give you a, a bit of a story that, you know, when Intuit started, it started based on our founder, Scott Cook, watching his wife balance the books at their kitchen table. And in fact, just a few buildings away from where I am, that kitchen table is, is in the lobby and people can see it. And he had this idea that an important capability was to have a follow me home. So this is the idea that we actually understand people as they're using our products in their home environment. And so the follow me home is an important way that we operate at Intuit. Analytics lets us do follow me homes at scale. What I mean by that, instead of watching and understanding and meeting with maybe a group of 10 or 50 or 100 people, this lets us analyze with permission data from millions or tens of millions of people so that we can really understand what's happening with our products, how people are using them, and how they move forward with them. That's a really great story and great examples as well, Ashok. Thank you for those. I, I wonder if you can talk a bit about some of the insights you're drawing from those follow me homes as you as you refer to it. Uh, you, you mentioned some examples of areas that you, you and your team are focused, but I would love to have you share some additional insights that you've garnered as a result of some of that analysis, if you would. Yeah, so there, there are so many, and I'm going to actually tie together um, analytics, artificial intelligence, and data all together at once, because as you said, these three things work very well together. And when they work together, uh, magic happens. So going back to a customer, let's say, who is running their small business, what we find through our data is that they need to manage their cash flow. And cash flow prediction, cash flow understanding is one of the most important things that a small business owner can do. Let me tell you what the problem is. If you're running a small business and you have uh, outlays, so that means that you need to pay your suppliers, you need to pay your employees, you need to pay others uh, that you uh, interact with, those are all outlays. And you need to make sure that you have money at the end of the month or at the end of the pay period to make those payments. Now, in a small business, money comes in, and the, that comes in through invoices that you uh, put out. It comes in through customers paying you, let's say, in, in a small business setting um, at a restaurant. They might be paying you on a daily basis for the food that they're buying and for the services that they're getting. So when we are making cash flow predictions, we want to literally make sure that there's enough money in the bank to pay the suppliers and the employees. It sounds like an easy problem, but I can tell you as a person who's run small businesses, it's challenging to do this because you never know if the invoices are gonna get paid on time. You never know quite how much you're gonna to have to pay because you don't know which invoices are coming in at what period. Now, we know this is a key issue through the analysis that we do, through the analytics that we do at scale. We know this through the follow me homes that we do. Frankly, we know this because people like me have run small businesses and we know the challenges that are faced. So that's where analytics comes in. Now, to make those predictions requires a couple of things. Amazing real-time data, and it also requires amazing algorithms to actually make those predictions. And I'm excited to tell you that when we're bringing all of these things together, we're seeing an amazing amount of engagement with customers. And we see this through analytics. So check this out, Peter. 5.5 times the click-through rate using these predictions as opposed to not providing these predictions. And a 95% take rate. 95%. That means that when we're showing people these experiences, 95% of them are taking those experiences and utilizing them. And I'm so excited about this because this means that people in the real world are benefiting from it. They're engaging with it. The AI, the data, and the analytics are all coming together to help people really understand what's happening with respect to their cash flow finances. 
That's a very powerful example, Ashok. Thank you for for sharing that, and also remarkable that the, that the data is showing you how how well that's in fact working. Uh, great validation for the the hard work you and your team have been doing. Um, let's talk about that team, if you don't mind, for a moment. Uh, would love to understand how you have built out that team, the scale of it, the sorts of skills that you're bringing on board in order to deliver what you've described, and, and frankly, uh, to what extent they are categorized or, or on sub-teams associated with the three main categories you talked about, or if they're, if some or all of them kind of cut across those different disciplines. Uh, share a bit more about them, if you would. Yeah, absolutely, Peter. Let me begin by saying that I'm incredibly fortunate to work with such a talented group of people, and I'm lucky to be able to talk to you about it, but uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands of people that I'm representing here, um, and they're dedicated to this idea that we're here to power prosperity around the world. And this mission of powering prosperity around the world is literally the way we built this team together. We are a mission-based organization. Our mission is to power prosperity around the world through the use of artificial intelligence, analytics, and data. Now, when we formed this team um, many years ago now, a bit more than five years ago, we had that mission and we started to recruit people in artificial intelligence. These are some of the most sought after people. But when they heard our mission, and when they saw the opportunity here to help transform small businesses, to help transform the experience of consumers, and to help them make better sense of their financial lives, to help them actually garner the use of AI and data so that they can power their own prosperity, people were really excited about it. And so we built this built this team of artificial intelligence scientists and engineers, and we focused them on what matters most. And that means what is best for the end customer. As we grew that, and as we started to see successes, I've just shared one success with you. There are hundreds of successes like that. As we started to build that and we brought the, the data teams in to our organization and we merged those teams together, we saw remarkable synergies because we could see that that data platform was powering a lot of experiences. And as we focused those data platforms on AI and then on analytics, we could see that uh, tremendous benefits were coming out of it. And so that's the way we grew this team bit by bit. It was a uh, it was a, a process that was extremely exciting because I remember hiring a lot of these people myself and seeing the sparkle in their eyes as they saw the, the opportunity ahead of them, the journey ahead of them. It was an, it was and is an incredible experience. So that's a little bit about it. I'm happy to go into any detail that, that you would like. Well, I'd also like to understand the way in which your organization partners with the rest of the company. Um, yeah. it, it, obviously, so much of what you're bringing to life, uh, no doubt, involves great collaboration with the various parts of the organization, whether those be functional areas, business units, you know, customer-facing functions, and so forth. Talk a bit about how you partner with and collaborate with other parts of the organization in order to bring all that you've described to life. Yeah, very closely. We partner very, very closely. Um, I want our teams and our teams themselves want to be embedded with the functional groups, with the business units that are all around this company, because we want to understand from the very, very uh, ultimate point what the customer problems are. And our business units, our functional groups, they're the ones who really are embedded in understanding those customer problems, in understanding where customers see value, where they don't see value, we want to be right there with them. And so our teams are embedded with the business units and functional groups. They do end up reporting to me and I report to the CTO of the company. And so we are a technology organization that is embedded in the business units and functional groups. And this has worked very well for us because it allows us to make sure that our AI scientists and engineers, that our analysts, that our data engineers, our data scientists and others really have a career path that can lead from uh, the, the first level of software engineer or data scientist or data analyst all the way to me as a senior vice president. 
And this gives them a, a clear path for career progression. It gives them mentorship opportunities. It gives them people who really understand AI and data and analytics as I do and as the leadership team does and as, as the managers do. So we, we know it, we understand it, we've lived it. But it also gives them this amazing opportunity to hear about the customer problems, to work with amazing product managers, senior leaders, who run the business on a day-to-day -day basis and see what their world is like. Because when we blend these worlds, when we have this ability to see the world, not through just one person's eyes, but through multiple diverse eyes, then we start to really be able to see how to solve these customer problems. It's incredibly exciting to see this happen. Uh, really fascinating. I appreciate you providing that that overview and uh, the the level of collaboration that that you and the, and the way, means by which you've even embedded uh uh, you're part of the organization in other parts as well. I, I, I know from a past conversation you and I had that an area of focus you have is on data systems, naturally. Um, you talked a bit about uh, driving change relative to persistence, uh, the development of data lakes and refinement of them, streaming services, clean data, data management. There's a lot uh, that one must do in order to get the right hygiene, for the lack of a better way of framing this, uh, correct in order to deliver all that you described in terms of some of the innovations that you're driving for the company and your company's customers. Can you talk a bit about um, the, the, the process of maturing those attributes in order to make sure that you are advancing those disciplines in concert with the appetite for greater innovation from this area? Absolutely. The data journey for a company that has been around for 40 years and I'd even say for smaller ones, I've worked with startups, I've been in startups uh, before, but for companies of the scale that we're talking about into it is a, a journey that really requires deliberate work. This is not something that can be done in a one-off approach where you just say, let's solve this data problem here and let's solve this data problem over there. We are a platform company. We're a technology platform company, and we think about data in terms of data platforms. So what does that mean? Well, as you said, we need to have great, clean data operating at scale that comes at the right cadence. And so that cadence might mean real time or close to real time. And frankly, it might mean batch processing as well. So we have components that do stream processing, that do batch processing, that transmit events at scale, that persist data in storage so that that data can be quickly accessed and analyzed, but that can also be secure and have the right access controls with it. We think about data platform having a curation component to it so that as data is brought from source systems, we can reconcile disparities in the data and transmit it to the data lake or to the product directly at the right cadence. These are some of the high level components that we have in our data system. So I think of it in terms of storage, processing, retrieval, analytics, all of these things working simultaneously together so that we can provide clean data. Now, you could ask me, do we have clean data at scale? And I'll say yes in some cases, but no in a lot of cases. It's a journey that we're on, but each day we are becoming better in our data journey. We're creating more clean entities, as we call them. These are these beautiful uh, data tables, essentially, that represent a whole domain that Intuit operates in. And we've created hundreds of these, uh, these, these clean entities. We've created many data marts, and these things work in parallel with each other to provide clean data at scale to our company. I wish that we had perfectly pristine clean data, but we don't. But I'm very confident that we are providing clean data at scale and that we're making the right steps to deliver more and more clean data at scale. And in my opinion, that is the realistic way to look at a data journey. Because as a person who has manipulated data now for a very long time, I've done it myself, I've done data engineering, I've done analytics, I've done AI, I've built models, I've done all of these things myself, I can tell you that clean data is something that is uh, a place that you strive for. But 
it's rare, unless you have a very limited data set, it's rare that you would declare with a straight face that all data is clean at any given time. I appreciate your candor about that. It's very, very interesting and a good framing of that. You alluded uh, uh, briefly among the, the important topics to the necessity for security and having the right access controls. Um, I want to talk about a related topic, which is artificial intelligence safety, uh, a topic that is debated uh, tremendously among uh, uh, great minds who focus on artificial intelligence. I wonder how you think about that. It's it's continued advancement, the necessity to to you know think years out in terms of the consequences of the de decisions made today. How you've incorporated that into the way in which you and your team operate as well. Uh, provide some thoughts there if you would. Absolutely, our artificial intelligence strategy is based on the fundamental idea that we want to make sure that our AI is free from bias that it's fair, that it's done in a responsible way, that it's well-governed, and that it's based on data that is well-governed, that is managed properly, that is customer-focused, and that is a foundation that we can all be proud of. And if you uh, take a moment, take a look at our data stewardship principles, these are uh, published on our website. And as you look at those uh, stewardship principles, you'll see that that forms the foundation for the way we think about data. AI is one of the uses of data, and we want to make sure that it's done in a responsible way. I can tell you, Peter, that um, when I started at this company and even before when I worked at other companies, when I worked at NASA, the right way to do AI and data was something that I've always been thinking about. I can remember in um, uh, an early job that I had at a startup, um, sitting with my team and thinking about the, the massive amount of data that we had at that time and trying to understand the best way to employ it and to use it. Here we've created what uh, we call a responsible AI program. And that responsible AI program is one that I, uh, members from the legal team, from the business team, from the technology teams, we all work together and we review on a regular basis the AI models that we've built and we think about how those models are being deployed in production. We analyze data that comes from those models to look for fairness, to make sure that uh, we understand how those models are operating. And we're making the steps every day in order to improve those areas. Because again, this is another journey. As we understand more about customer preferences, as we understand more about the regulatory landscape, as we understand more about the models themselves, we're continuously evolving in these areas. And so this is something that we, um, I'm very excited about. And I know that our teams are excited about it. They think about it a lot. And together we're just uh, working more and more to, to make sure that that responsible AI program, the data governance programs, all the programs that we're running are doing the right thing for the end customer. Ashok, I mentioned at the outset that you have an unusually long tenure in your role. Now, as you pointed out, beyond five years. Um, and and it, it, these are topics, as you highlight, that have been part of your uh, professional experience for many years now. Um, no doubt you've gotten to know some of your peers who carry the same title. And as it is a relatively new title, the construction of that role is very different company to company. Uh, and I mentioned that the average tenure is uh, much lower than your own. Somewhere between one and two years now is the latest data, at least that I have seen, uh, which would suggest that it's not, you know, for there are a lot of people that are entering into these roles and for a, you know, a variety of reasons are not succeeding. Um, uh, and I wonder if you have your own diagnosis. I can I can hear, frankly, through the answers to, to uh, that you've given across our conversation, your level of experience, your planfulness, your your thought process about the differentiating factors uh, and the necessity to focus on them in different ways, the building of a great team. Surely all those things, among others, are, are reasons for your longevity, uh, uh, aside from from uh, the great leadership and brain power that you bring to the role. Um, but I wonder if you have any other thoughts about why this is a role in so many organizations uh, that at least the first uh, or even second occupant of it may not be as successful as you have been. Well, thank you for the question, Peter. Um, I do want to say that uh, 
Intuit is a remarkable company. Um, and I realize that I'm an employee. I realize that that might sound like a very biased uh, remark. But if you look at the data, if you look at the history of the company, if you look at the leadership of the company, if you look at the employees of the company, this is a company which routinely ranks in the top best places to work in the world. Um, I think that this that, that the statistic is that in the past 20 years, we've been in the top ranks consistently. And so the reason I start with that is to say that um, it's true that I, I have been successful, but it takes a company, it takes the right leadership, it takes the right employee base, it takes the right focus. And for us, the focus is the end customer. And when we focus like that, it galvanizes people. I tell you that I do global team meetings, I do site visits, I meet with uh, employees, I meet with uh, stakeholders, I meet with business partners. And when you talk about the customer, people's eyes light up. Now, what does that have to do with my longevity and what does that have to do with my role? Well, I took my role and I said, I believe that the most important thing that we can do is to help power prosperity around the world. I did not come into this role and say, I believe the most important thing we can do is to deploy deep learning in as many places as possible, as quickly as possible. I did not come into this role thinking that um, I have the best ideas on how to change the data landscape, and boy, I'm going to do it on day one. Frankly, I know deep learning, I know neural networks, I know data systems, I know analytics super well. But what I really am interested in is solving that end problem for the end customer. That person who is in South Bend, Indiana, that person who's in Cedar Rapid, uh, Iowa, that person who's in San Francisco, California. My goal is to make sure that that person is successful and do whatever we can with AI, with analytics, and with data to help solve that person's problem. Now, I'm sure that I'm not the only one that thinks like this, but I am sure that I'm uh, a person who's in an environment that comes together, that galvanizes behind that kind of mission. And so that's what I think is uh, part of uh, the success that I have. I have an amazing team. I have an amazing set of people that I work with on a daily basis. I feel very privileged to be a part of uh, an organization like that. Well, that's really a, a great reflection. Uh you, I also mentioned at the outset, you're an adjunct professor uh, in the electrical engineering department at Stanford. And, and I wonder if you could just share a bit about why that has been important to you. You, you clearly have a very, uh, you know, uh, uh, important job that no doubt to keeps you plenty busy. Uh, what, why and, 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 and what, why, why have you uh, continued to have uh, the relationship with academe? And I also wonder how you sort of balance, uh, balance your responsibilities across those. I do it because I love to learn. Hmm. And I feel very, very lucky to be, um, you know, just a few miles from Stanford, a few miles from Berkeley, uh, from UC Santa Cruz, and so many other universities. I grew up in a family where my father was a professor, my wife is a professor, and where learning was and is an important part of life. And the opportunity to be affiliated with a university like Stanford, to be able to work with the remarkable, absolutely remarkable professors there and the students there and the faculty and the staff, I think is, is just a tremendous honor. And so I'm just fortunate to be, to be able to call myself an adjunct professor. So at a high level, frankly, that is my motivation, is to be in a, an environment where I can learn from the best that I can contribute wherever I can. And what we do here at Intuit is we build great technology that's customer focused, no doubt, but we also build great technology. And I want to learn and see the germination point for those ideas. And those ideas often, not always, but they often come from universities like Stanford, like University of Colorado, like many other universities around the country and around the world. And so to be able to be there and to see these ideas germinate, to understand the context of it, to see the students and to be able to work with the students who are 
pushing with their professors and with their others, the boundaries of knowledge is incredibly exciting and rewarding. And so that's why I do it. And it helps us, in my opinion, at Intuit and the other places that, that I've worked, orient ourselves to what's happening at the foundations of the field. Because when you know and you understand the foundations, then you know how to build a great skyscrapers on top of it. You know how to build a great parks. You know how to build a great places to be, right? And that's what we're trying to do here. I'm using that as a metaphor, but I'm saying that when you know the foundations of the field, you can build a great experiences, great technologies on top of it. So that's the way I think about it. Balancing the time, I have to say that I love it so much that it balances itself out. Yeah, I mean, I, I work a lot here. I don't teach at Stanford. I'm uh, on people's thesis committees. I collaborate with uh, uh, professors there and so forth. So I don't teach. That does reduce my burden uh, in terms of the, the teaching assignments. But um, the time spent there is incredibly rewarding. And the time I spend with other universities is incredibly rewarding. Just a few weeks ago, I was visiting University of Notre Dame. And... Um, you know, when I was there, I was thinking about the small businesses in South Bend. I was talking with people in small in, in, in South Bend, and that's why I'm using that as an example here. It means a lot to me to visit places like that and to visit the universities and the students and the faculty and the small businesses that operate all over the country, all over the world. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I, I love this uh, connection point you have to uh, to where technology and ideas are are at their genesis point. Uh, I, I really like the way you describe that. And, and I wonder, you know, we've talked about so many trends across this conversation naturally, but uh, as you contemplate uh, your day job uh, and your, your relationship with a variety of different universities and the great minds you have access to as a result of that, what are some other trends that excite you as you look to the future? What are the, some of the things that you are... Uh, you know, beginning to either put on your professional roadmap or your personal roadmap uh, that reflect uh, the excitement you have for some things that are germinating? There are so many things that are happening today. Um, I view uh, some of the work that's happening in generative AI, and I'm sure I'm not unique in this point of view, as being incredibly exciting. Uh, the idea that we can create art, music, uh, language, from artificial intelligence models, I think is remarkable. As a person who, you know, studied neural networks when I was doing my PhD many years ago until today, if you just look at the way this field has evolved, what's happening today was, I think, unthinkable back then. And so that's a remarkable uh, journey that we're on. I also think that um, the changing uh, landscape of privacy, of security, of proper governance of responsible AI, of responsible use of data is something that's really important for all of us in society to think about, to invest in, and to build systems that can evolve with the changing landscape of privacy and security and compliance issues. And that may not sound as exciting as talking about generative AI, but I can tell you that it's as important, if not more important. Because when we're working in a world, when we're living in a world where AI and data uh, is going to be ubiquitous, the right use of those capabilities is paramount. And I want to be uh, part of an organization. I want to be part of uh, a science of an engineering discipline, which thinks about those things first and foremost, and not as an afterthought, not as something that is there because we have to do it. We should do it because we want to do it. Yeah, very interesting reflections. I, I appreciate you sharing those. Um, I, I wanted to uh, close with a question about some of the secrets to your own success, uh, Ashok. And I can certainly hear throughout your responses some of the answers to that. The fact that you, uh, you know, ha had uh, parents that that uh, gave you a love of learning. The fact that you uh, elected to go. Uh, for the most advanced of degrees, a PhD in a discipline that is on, uh, you know, on the rise and increasing in relevance. The fact that you surround yourself with people uh, who are equally bright to yourself, uh, who can test your thinking and push that thinking. Uh, the fact that you are in an organization and, and have been pushed yourself to have the big picture in mind, the mission of the organization before the technology or data or, or artificial intelligence, uh, that you have those uh, that, that customer 
uh, in mind first and foremost, and that 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 sort of orients uh, the team in the right direction. I wonder if there there are things I'm missing here or that you've not yet had a chance to reflect on that you see as some of the keys to your professional success. And it's a question I like to ask Ashok as somebody who is a a mentor, uh, you know, serves on the thesis committees to, to people who are decades younger than yourself in the early stages of their professional career. Would love to hear some of the things, especially with some of those folks in mind, people who might wish to follow in your footsteps. You touched on so many things. Um, and again, I, I want to acknowledge that I, I have a an amazing role, um, an amazing company, and an amazing uh, point in time and in history. I, I really do feel that way. I would say that it's very important to be able to listen and to learn from what you've heard and to not just come with your own preconceived notions about what's right and wrong, but to actually be able to listen to other points of view and to adapt and to be able to maintain your point of view when you think you're right and to be able to say, wow, I was totally wrong. And to be able to say that not because it's the cool thing to say in Silicon Valley, but because it's actually true that we make mistakes, that I make mistakes, and that I can learn from them, and that that we give ourselves the opportunity to, to listen eloquently and to not just show up with the right answer because we have a title, because we have a degree, because we have a background, because we have a circumstance. That's not, I, I, I don't think that those things lead to the best outcomes that we need. Our society faces a remarkable set of circumstances ahead of us, a remarkable number of challenges. And we need people here who are willing to think about things critically, who are willing to analyze data to make good decisions, who are willing to sacrifice themselves and their interests for the broader interest that's out there. Because society depends on all of us as leaders, society depends on us, and we need to make the right decisions together. Everyone in society, that doesn't mean executives, that doesn't mean professors, that doesn't mean students, that means literally everyone needs to do that. And to do that, we have to be able to listen to each other, we have to be able to accommodate other points of view, and we have to be able to grow from those interactions. Remarkably well said. I love the phrase, listen eloquently, <laughs> and, and uh, the necessity to uh, to listen to many points of view, even those that perhaps make you uncomfortable or disagree with your points of view. In fact, actually, that that's a, uh, you know, a path towards better conclusions, uh, potentially as well. Well, uh, Ashok Srivastava, it's so great to spend some time with you. Thank you so much for taking time and, and sharing a bit about your own perspectives, your experience uh, uh, during your tenure at, at Intuit, more broadly speaking, across your career. Uh, the many areas that you are influencing and, and uh, are influenced by. It's been a, a wonderful conversation. Peter, thank you. It's such an honor to be part of your podcast. I uh, really thank you for all of the work that you're doing to bring uh, technology leaders together to help people understand how technology can inform society and bring the best outcomes for society. So thank you again for having me here. Well, you're, very, you're very kind to say so. Thank you so much.